Hello, welcome back. So in the previous class, we looked at yield measures for fixed rate bonds. Now we're gonna look at yield measures for floating rate notes. So compared to the fixed rate bonds, the market price of the floating rate notes, they are much more stable. Why? Because the, the interest rates, the floating rate notes, as we know, they adjust for changes in market interest rates. So we no longer have a fixed coupon anymore. So how does the coupon work of the FRN? We know that, we know how it works, eh? So the coupon of the FRN, it's based on a reference rate, like something like LIBOR, or like we've discussed, plus, or sometimes a minus, so we'll see why minus in a minute, but let's just go with plus for now. So it's gonna be, the, if the, the coupon is gonna be the reference rate, plus a fixed spread. I'm gonna underline fixed for a reason, and we're kind of, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. So the spread, over the reference rate, this is called the quoted margin. So this quoted margin, that is fixed. That's why I underlined the fixed there. So I'm gonna put an F there for fixed, because it's gonna be important when we come to the, the next slide. So basically, the, the lower the credit quality is of the issuer, the higher the spread they must pay over the reference rate to compensate investors for the extra risk. So let's try this example over here. We've got a three month US LIBOR. This is used as the reference rate for an FRN that resets uh, interest rates quarterly. So if they're gonna reset quarterly, then they must use the three month US LIBOR rate as a reference rate. So if the issuer, if they've got more credit risk than the banks that are in LIBOR. Because remember, when we discussed LIBOR, we said this is the rate that banks lend to each other at. So if the issue's got more credit risks than the banks that are included in LIBOR, then the FRN is gonna pay the LIBOR rate plus a quoted margin because they've got to add on because they're more now, the issue is now more risky than the banks are. So let's say, for example, the FRN can pay three months use LIBOR plus 0.4%, or we call that 40 basis points, because remember 100 basis points is 1%. So 0.4%, that'll be 40 basis points. But now let's say the issuer has less credit risk than the banks included in LIBOR. So maybe something like Apple, you know, such a massive company, maybe if they issue an FRN, they can pay a rate on their FRN below LIBOR. So now the FRN is going to pay three month US LIBOR minus the quoted margin. So uh, let's say they pay three month LIBOR minus 10.1% or in other words, that's 10 basis points. Right now, how does this coupon rate work? We have discussed this before, but this is now fantastic revision for us. The coupon rate paid at the end of quarter one, that is gonna be based on the three month US LIBOR rate at the issue date. In other words, at the start of quarter one of the bond. And the coupon rate then paid at the end of quarter two, that's based on the three month US LIBOR uh, rate at the start of quarter two. So we call that the in a structure. And we will also talk a bit more about that when we get to the derivative section. So let's, now go on to the next slide. So here, the, the now we've got something called the required margin, also, also called the discount margin. This is the spread that makes the FRN to be priced at par on a reset date. So if the issuer's credit quality changes, then of course, the required margin, that is going to change. So let's just stop there for a second. Uh, if, if, if the issue is credit risk doesn't change, then of course the required margin, that's also not gonna change. But we've got here, you know, if, it, if it credit risk changes, then the required margin, of course, is gonna change. So now the required margin is gonna be different to the quoted margin, why? Because remember on the previous slide, we made a big deal about quoted margin. We put an F there, because the quoted margin we said is fixed. So now let's see what we've got here. If the credit risk of the, of the issuer, if it increases, so in other words, the credit quality now deteriorates, this means that the required margin must go up to compensate investors for the extra risk. And now that required margin is gonna be above the quoted margin because the quoted margin is fixed. So let's just put an F there again, just to make sure we, we're all on the same page. So now, we know our relationships, and this is fantastic revision as well, that if, if, if you've got a higher yield here, 
This means that the, 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 the FRM price is going to go down. It's going to be below the par at reset date. Also, we can think of it, credit risk has increased. So the price is going to, it's going to drop. But now what happens if the credit risk decreases? So now, in other words, the issue is credit quality, it's improved. Now the required margin, that's going to fall because there's now less risk. So investors, they require lower yield to be compensated for less risk. So now the quoted, that's going to be below our fixed quoted margin there. So now, like we know, like yield down, price up, as we know our relationship, we know it so well. If you don't, if you've forgotten it and need to revise and how it works, just go back to the previous classes and we'll all be there. So then now the price is going to be above par if the credit quality improves. So you can also think of it like there's less risk, so the price is going to be higher. So um, I did see a CFA Institute practice problem, and it was exactly something like this. They, they gave us three bonds, and they wanted to know, you know, which one, which of which one of the three would, would we see the price above par, and we, we needed to find the one where the required margin was below the quoted margin, and that was going to be our answer. So you'll see it there, nice and easy. Good. So we're going to now to to. To, to prove this, on the next slide, we're going to be doing a little example. I don't know how necessary the example is. I think what we've done here is more important, but we're going to do it anyway, just, just for completeness. So I, uh, I don't know how important it is, but anyway, let's do it. So now, to estimate the price of a floating rate note on, re on, reset, on a reset date, this is what we can do. Um, but before we look at this, if you think this looks bad, you should see what the what the real, because we're estimating here, you, to, to actually get the actual price of the FRN, you, you must have a look in the CF Institute, Institute book at the formula. It's really hectic. So obviously they'll never have, we'll never have to use that formula on the exam. If worse comes to worse, we can do it like this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the reference rate plus that quoted fixed margin to estimate the future cash flows of the FRN. And once we've got, once we've worked out those future cash flows, then we're going to discount them at the reference rate plus the required or the discount margin. So those two to go, go together. We, we discount the cash flows at the discount or the required margin. So here's our example. Uh, we've got an FRN, pays semi-annual coupons based on 180-day US LIBOR plus 30 basis points. So that is going to be the, the quoted margin. So this may be put in there the QM. That's the fixed amount they're paying, right? So that's the quoted margin. So on a, on a reset date uh, with four years to maturity, now the 180 day US LIBOR, that is two and a half percent. So in scenario one, we've got now, they want us to work out the value of the FRN. If the required margin is 40 basis points. So what has happened over here? Things have got worse, eh? Because now the required margin has gone up, which means the credit quality has deteriorated because investors require a higher yield to compensate them for the extra risk. So with step one, remember step one, to work out the future cash flows, we use the reference rate plus that quoted margin there. Um, and so the reference rate is two and a half percent. The quoted margin is 30 basis points there. So uh, that's going to, it's a semi-annual bond. So we're going to divide then by two. So what does this mean? We, the investors are going to get $1.40 every six months, eh? Because it's a, it's a semi-annual pay. So now step two, we need to discount these cash flows at what? The, the reference rate plus the required or the discount margin. So the required margin is now uh, 40 basis points. So we, we, we need to add the 40 basis points there to whatever LIBOR is, the 2.5%. So now we can see we've got a higher rate. So there we've, we've got a higher rate now. We can discount, discount the cash flows at a higher rate. So how many periods have we got? Nice and easy. So we've got, uh, there's four years to maturity, semi-annual pay. So there's, there's eight periods. And uh, we've worked out what the future cash flows are there. And I put them in red there, the $1.40. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, but now the I over Y, this is the discount rate. We're going to discount them at the slightly higher rate there, 145. The future value is always the par. So we can see that the value there is slightly there below par. Hey? So that's what we said on the previous slide, that if the if the um, margin go, if the yield goes up a little bit right the, the the required margin goes up a little bit the the price is just below par and now in scenario two we've got the other way around now in scenario two the required margin is 20 basis points so it's gone down from 30 to 20 so what what must have happened in scenario two the issue is credit quality has improved it's become less risky so now Everything is the same because the, the future cash flows is, is like, like it was with in scenario one, where we use the reference rate plus the fixed quoted margin there. So that remains the same. Now, the only difference is we're going to discount them at the uh, at the LIBOR rate there, the 2.5%, the reference rate 2.5%, plus now the required or the discount margin is now 20 basis points and not and not 40 anymore. That's the only difference. So what have we got? We've got a slightly lower now discount rate over here. That's the only difference from above, which is going to result in what the price doing what? Of course, we know price up a bit, which makes sense because there's now less risk. Required margin is down. Uh, investors require lower yield. So there's less, 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 less risk. So the price slightly above par. Okay, excellent. So nothing too serious there. Now what we're going to look at is the, uh, is the yield measures for money market instruments. And we know that these guys, they've got maturities of less than a year. Now there is a problem with money market instruments that we've spoken about before, is that some of them are quoted on a discount rate basis and some of them are quoted on an add-on rate basis. And another problem we have is that some use a 360-day year like we've seen, and others use a 365-day year. So now, to be able to compare different types of money market instruments, we need, we, we, we need to convert the rates to a common basis. And the common basis that the financial world has decided upon is this, add-on yield for a 365 day year. I guess they could have come up with discount rate uh, method based on 360 day year or whatever, but this is what they've decided upon. And this is what we need to, to do. If we want to compare one with the other, we need to work out the rate on, a, on, a, on an add on yield basis for a 365 day year. And they call this the bond equivalent yield. So these are our common discount rate instruments that we get. Things like commercial paper we've discussed, treasury bills we know, uh, and bankers' acceptances. And then the add-on instruments, the main ones we get, get are the bank certificates of deposits and the LIBOR indexes. So let's try this little example, and we're then going to see it's not so bad. So we've got in example one, a $100,000 treasury bill with 240 days to maturity. And it's quoted with an annualized discount rate. There's a discount rate here of 0.85%. And it's based on a 360 day year. So they want us to work out what is the bond equivalent yield. So what, what we need to work out first is what's the discount amount in dollars. So the discount rate is 0.85%, but that's annualized. So that, that, that's for a year. So we've got to unannualize it, so to speak. So we take 240. And, and we're based on 360 day year, we multiply it by the $100,000. So that is the discount of the treasury bill. So what is its current price in the market? All we need to do is subtract the discount and there we get the current price. So what this means is that it's a discount instrument. So investors will give the US government $99,433 today. And what do they get back? They're going to get back the 100,000, the par, in 240 days' time. So what is the yield or the return then for the investor? It's like always, it's the profit divided by amount invested. So what's the profit for the investors? They're making 566 there. What's the amount they're investing? The investors are giving 99,433. And there we get the yield 
that is now for the 240 days. So now we've done step one, the BY, we must be on a yield basis, not a discount rate basis. So we've converted it to a yield, but we're not done yet because we've got to now annualize that because that's only for 240 days. So all we need to do now, remember the BEY, it's based on a 365 day yield. So we've got to annualize this up for a 365 day year. So that's going to give us a BEY of 0.8667%. So I made a little note here because also remember they love to ask these things on the exam, the, the conceptual stuff. We can see that the discount rate of 0.85% that understates the investor's return because what does the investor really make? 0.8667%. Okay, dokes. Let's try the next one. Here, we've got a $100,000 bank certificate of deposit, 90 days to maturity. It's quoted with an annualized add-on yield. Oh, good news. It's the right way around this time. It's not discount because BEY is based on add-on yield. So it's, it's, everything is looking good. Only problem is it's based on a 360-day year. So now to work out the BEY, well, it's not so bad because we don't have to change this. It's, it, it, it is already a yield. So all we've got to do is convert it to a 365 day year and we've done everything we needed to do. So we just take that 1.25%. We now make it a 365 day year because that's what, how BEY works. Remember 365 day year on an add on yield basis. So we're going to get one2 1.2674%. Right, and then example three is the easiest. This is the uh, uh, last thing we can look at in this class, a nice, easy way to end off, which is good news. Uh, we've got the same CD now as, as above, but now it's based on a 365 day year. So everything is correct for BEY because it's add on yield based on 365 day year. So what do we need to do? Absolutely nothing. If they ask this on the exam, we mustn't try and calculate things and be confused by that. We're just going to take that. Well, there we go. It's 1.28 percent, and that's that's the answer. So that's the end. Then a nice, nice short little class um, uh, on the yield on, on more yield measures. But just before we we run away here, the actual way the CFA Institute do it to work out this yield. To, to, or to convert rather the discount rate into a yield, it's very complicated. They use these, these very, very ugly formulas and I find this much easier just to do it this way. And in the CFA Institute practice problems, there were these two problems and this one, I did it using the uh, method we've just done on the slide, exactly the same thing that we did on the slide. And for, and for this question as well, I've done it our methods. You'll see the way CF Institute, Institute is rather scary. So I think this is going to be much better for us. Excellent. So then that's the end then of this class. I just practiced these little examples and we're going to become very good at them. And we'll see you guys in the next class. Hello, it's Tim here again. I hope you enjoyed the class and found it beneficial. We have some classes available for free on YouTube, but we have classes for the entire curriculum. The classes that are not on YouTube can be purchased from us. If you'd like to purchase the classes, please contact us for the pricing. And I've put our contact details over here. You can purchase all the classes or certain readings that you would like. When you purchase the classes, we provide you with the slides and our notes. I've assisted hundreds of candidates pass CFA exams, and I look forward to also helping you through the CFA program. I've put in two testimonials in the slide over here, and we also have a testimonials page at, on our website that you can review. I look forward to seeing you soon and all the best.